A salesman selling vacuum cleaners knocked on the door of a remote farmhouse. When the lady of the house opened the door, he walked in and dumped a bag of dirt on the floor. Now, boasted the salesman, I want to make a bargain with you. If this super-duper new vacuum cleaner doesn't clean up every bit of this dirt, I'll eat it what's left. Here's a spoon, said the farmer's wife. We don't have any electricity. (laughs) So confidence, sometimes it's placed in things that can't deliver, and sometimes we just make assumptions about its basis without really checking if they're true. So the past several months, God's been impressing upon my heart the thought that what is commonly held by the world as the basis for confidence is contrary to God's Word. I've time and and again witnessed the damage caused by these errant views to brothers, to sisters, to friends, to believers, to unbelievers, family, So this morning, what I would like us to do is to come and reason together through the Scriptures and weigh in the balance the world's thoughts against those of the touchstone of truth. Before you you and I do that, would you join me in prayer? God, you're a great God. And the the praises this morning you are worthy of, for you are king, and you are the only one. I pray that uh, what we go over in your word this morning, that you would visit with unction, that that you would bring your word to bear on our hearts, and that we would see your truth and acknowledge it. Lord, may we be open, may we be humble. And may you work. Thank you, thank you for Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So this morning we're going to be going through several scriptures. Um, our jump off point is going to be Proverbs, Proverbs 14, 26. So you can go ahead and turn there. That's going to be our starting point. We're going to be looking at three areas that the world holds to when it's looking for confidence. It looks to self-respect, it looks to belief in self, and it looks to self-esteem. And what I want to do is bring the Word and see how those things measure up against the Word. And if we're lacking, may we have the humility to receive what God has for us in His Word. So the first area I want us to look at is is this notion of self-respect. As one definition goes, self-respect is having pride in oneself and one's accomplishments. Pride in oneself and one's accomplishments. Self-respect. So Proverbs 14, 26 says, In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and his children will have refuge. So don't miss what's stated first. It says, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. So the one being respected here, and we're talking about the fear of the Lord or the fear of God, we're not talking about being afraid of God. We're talking about being afraid to hurt him, afraid to do anything against him because we deeply reverence, respect, and love him. Do you get it? So this is about loving and respecting God. And it's, and it's in that is confidence. So it's opposite what the world would say. The world says, hey, have confidence in yourself, look to yourself, respect yourself. That's where it is. The scripture says otherwise. It's about respecting God, not respecting yourself. Very contrary. I remember as a child, my, my Father would faithfully preach and sit in the front row with my mom and my siblings and occasionally goof off and get the look and the lean over and the whisper 
where the enunciation was very precise and you knew you didn't have the fear of God, but you were about to see it. (laughs) So my parents might have retired as parents in that respect. They could always be leather workers because they were really good at tanning hides. (laughs) So I had to grow in the fear of the Lord because I didn't respect him. As one of Job's friends said in Job 8, 11 through 14, he says, can the papyrus grow up without a marsh? Can the rushes grow without water? While it is still green and not cut down, yet it withers before any other plant. So are the paths of all who forget God. And the hope of the godless will perish, whose confidence is fragile and whose trust is a spider's web. So yeah, yeah, you can have self-respect and there might be some confidence there. But it's going to be flimsy at best. And it's going to be short-lived. I don't think self-respect really measures up to what the Word of God says. What about believing in yourself? It's the second area I want to look at. That uh, if we believe in ourselves, we'll have the confidence to press on, believe ourselves as we look at our potential, as we look hopes towards the future. Again, let's uh, turn to the Scripture and see what we're supposed to be believing in. Psalm 27 Psalm 27, verses 1 through 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. The war arises against me in spite of this. I shall be confident. Notice who the trust is in. Notice who the belief is in. It's in God and his character. And David acknowledges that he's a faithful God. And he knows that character. And he can believe in who that God is. Not in himself. Flip over a few more psalms to Psalm 71. Psalm 71, verses 1 through 5. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of habitation to which I may continually come. You've given commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the grasp of the wrongdoer and ruthless man, for you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my confidence from my youth. Again, What is David trusting in? Who is David trusting in? Who is David believing in? Where does his confidence rest? It's again, it's in the character and nature of God and him alone. Now we get a contrary statement to this. If we're going to believe in something, we, we get that we can believe in God, that he is trustworthy, that he is faithful that we can believe in him. On the flip side, we're actually warned about ourselves. We're actually warned about ourselves. Look with me to, at Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14:12. 14, Proverbs 14:12 says there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Okay? Let me give you another proverb. Proverbs 16:25. Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Word for word, the same. Anytime something's repeated, 
It's important. And what's important here? You and I can't trust ourselves. Because it can seem right to us, it seems good to me, and it can be wrong. What I believe in, in myself, can be wrong. But God's word is pure. It's true. He's reliable. I can rely upon him absolutely, totally, and without question. He has proven himself faithful time and time again. Um, As a high school student and as a college student, I was also an athlete, and I had uh, the opportunity to go to a lot of different swim meets. I was a swimmer, successful, did well, and my father was faithful to remind me time and again to keep me in my place. He'd say, Nate, you know, without God, you wouldn't have any talent. Without God, you wouldn't have any health. Without God, you wouldn't have the opportunity. Without God, you wouldn't even have any money. Without God, you wouldn't have this. So he was putting me back into the place where he was reminding me that, oh, yeah, yeah, you got a good, you're, you're a good swimmer, but, but really, it's God, God who provided the opportunity. It's God who did all of these things. It was always easy to remember talent, health, opportunity, money, because those are the first four letters of my last name. <laughs> simple things for simple people, Right? But it was helpful to remember, to, to remember this is actually God. It's not me. So biblically, strong confidence finds its trust in God and not in oneself. To believe in oneself is, is an attempt to build a house on a foundation of sand. It's ever-shifting And it's ever-changing based upon circumstances and situations. To build your trust on God is to build on a foundation of absolute bedrock. Because he is never changing, ever dependable, faithful, good, wise. So measuring up belief in self versus belief in God doesn't measure up. The last one I want us to visit is self-esteem. And I know this is a big one for a lot of people because it's absolutely embedded in our society that without self-esteem, I can't function. So I'm going to ask you to listen to me and not just check out, not be that dad that says, that's it, hand me the coloring books. I'm done. Please listen. Please listen to what God's word says about self-esteem. Self-esteem is looking to myself as the bomb, basically. Looking out for number one. If I've got high self-esteem, then I'll be able to function in society. And I want us to really look at this one intensely and see what The Bible tells us to do as Christians. Turn with me to Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself up for me. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that verse. Pastor Robert Davis spent a whole sermon on it. Did a great job. Look it up online. What I want you to focus in on is that first phrase. 
I have been crucified with Christ. Crucifixion requires death. Hold that in your mind. Turn to Philippians 3, 7 through 11. Philippians 3, 7 to 11. But whatever things were gained to me, those, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the passing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I want you to focus in on that one phrase, that I may attain to his death. Hold that. John, turn to John 3, 26 through 30. John the Baptist. John 3, 26 through 30. John the Baptist speaking here. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. It's not fair. You've been around longer. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, and I must decrease. Do you get it? Consistently, Galatians, Philippians, John, die. Die, die. This isn't the world's version of self-esteem. This is death to self. And to not die to self, that's death. So the scripture does not call for us to esteem ourselves calls for us to be crucified. It begs, I want to become like him in his death. And it pleads, I must decrease and he must increase. This isn't self-denigration for the sake of acting humble. This is a full-on replacement. I'm not talking about your unique personality traits either. I'm talking about the replacement of the desire to put oneself ahead of everything and replacing that with Christ who, who drives us to serve, to love, and to reach out to others. It's others-focused and not self-focused. We need to die. So someone might say, well, wait a minute, isn't there a scripture about, I don't know, esteeming ourselves? Yeah, yeah, there is. Romans 12, 3. But we're going to turn there, we're going to read it in its context. Romans 12, and let's read verses 1 through 8. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. It's not looking good. Acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may, be, may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to, make, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, 
but to think so as to have sound judgment. Think rightly. As God has allotted to each a measure of faith, for just as we have many members in a body, and all members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to each of us, is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service and serving, he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. The whole thrust, the whole context of this, besides the fact that it starts off with us being living sacrifices, and a sacrifice dies... Besides all of that, the whole context is about you and I in the body of Christ and that you and I aren't to think more highly of ourselves saying, I'm the guy that's up here in the pulpit, therefore I'm more important than you. It's a lie. Or I'm the guy that's in front teaching, I'm more important than you. It's a lie. Or to think, I'm only the little old lady who's at home, and all I do is pray. And so it doesn't really matter. It's a lie. You see, this passage, the whole thrust, says we're all members of the body, and each one of us is very important. And for me to think myself in any way ill-used, ill-treated, not used enough, is wrong. or to think myself overused, or to think myself insignificant is wrong. We're in this body together because Christ has put us here as a body, together. Okay. Isn't there a verse about looking out for our own interests? There is. It's in Philippians. It's in chapter 2. But let's look at the context. Verses 1 through 3. Philippians 2. Verses 1 through 11. Sorry, 1 through 11. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any uh, affection and compassion, make my joy complete. By becoming of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, this isn't about me. And the attitude we're supposed to have, the example that he gives us is Christ himself, God incarnate. And he had the attitude of a servant. Do you think, do we think ourselves more highly than Christ? We do if we take on an attitude other than this. We exalt ourselves more. We esteem ourselves more. So someone might say, I'm with you, Nate. We need to look to God as our strength. True. We do. 
But a word of caution in that, I want us to check our motives in saying that. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 through 11, there's a commonly quoted passage in here. But I want us to make sure that we take in the full context of the heart behind it, lest we find ourselves ill-using it. And he, God, has said to me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's what's quoted. When I am weak, then I am strong. I'm, I'm feeling weak, and therefore I'm strong. Wait, wait a minute. Verse 11, I become foolish. You yourselves compel me. Actually, I should have been commended by you, for in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent apostles. Even though, even though, even though I am a nobody. What's his perspective? What's Paul's perspective on himself? I'm nobody. I'm no one. I'm insignificant. I glory in my weaknesses because Christ is exalted. Because the only way I can make this is because of God. And he gets the glory he deserves. That's the way it should be looked at. As opposed to, I'm feeling rather puny today. I'm going to read my Bible, get pumped up, and feel better about myself. This isn't an inspirational book. This is a book that calls us to die and reach out and grab hold of Christ as the only option. As the only option. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful even in our biblical understanding of our position in Christ. Don't use your position in Christ as, again, another focus on self in a biblical way. Who I am in Christ. Because what it's supposed to be about is who I am in Christ. Emphasis, him. It's our hope, it's our assurance, it's what we look to in faith. Who I am in Christ is biblical truth, but it's not to be abused and to feed egos. I'm not to look in the mirror and say, who's the man? You're the man. It's more like, I don't know, who's got two thumbs and needs to die? This guy. So um, for you parents who say, okay, Nate, should I tell my kids to die? No, don't put it to them that way unless you like nightmares and getting up in the middle of the night. But you know what I'm saying, the thrust of what I'm saying. What we need to tell our kids isn't about self-esteem, isn't about self-respect, isn't about believing in ourselves and you can do whatever it is. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And misquoting verses so that we inspire them to become doctors, lawyers, and astronauts. Well, maybe not lawyers, but doctors and astronauts. Instead, what we should be teaching our kids is that you and I are totally consumed by ourselves. We're self-centered, self-serving, self-loving, proud, self-willed individuals that have no regard for anything that doesn't provide some benefit ourselves. That's what we are. That's what we are apart from Christ. We need to tell our children that they need Jesus to fill their lives just as bad as dad and mom. Ever so desperately. That it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. That he's my everything. He's my confidence.
So I've said a lot, and I know I'm talking to two groups of people today. I'm talking to those of you who don't know this Christ, who haven't trusted this Christ, who haven't come to this Christ. And, and I'm using a lot of language and verbiage that you're saying I, I don't get. And, and Nate, I, I get it about the whole self-esteem and stuff. But what I'd really like, what I'd really like is love. Well, let me get, get you to a passage that wraps its arms around love but also puts us in our place as far as God as the answer. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And we'll look at verses 31 through 37. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Song we sing. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as written, for your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, We overwhelmingly conquer, not by our own selves, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The call is to bow your knee this morning to the king. He provided a way for you to be right with a holy God in Christ Jesus. And as your Lord and as your Savior, you will know a love that no human element can either replicate or threaten. You want love? Bow the knee. Die to self. End it. End your hope in yourself. So to believers, so to believers, the call is pretty clear. We need to die, folks. We need to die to self. It needs to go. I've seen it too much with family members. I've seen it too much with friends. I've seen it with church members. I've seen it time and time and time again, pride, as it rears its ugly head and does damage to the individual and to those around them. It's got to go. It's got to go. we got to die. I want to die. I want to die to self. Will you join me? Will you join hands with me and die? Die to self. And be filled up with nothing but Jesus Christ. That's how you replace the empty. You fill it up to the fullest with Jesus, with God himself, a faithful God a wise God, a good God, a loving God, a sovereign God. Let's die. Let's die together. Let's die as a church. Let Southside Bible Church be known for the death of self and the glorification of Christ and the exaltation of God.
In the year 1847, a doctor from Edinburgh, Sir James Simpson, discovered that chloroform could be used as an anesthetic to render people insensible to pain of surgery. From his early experiments, Dr. Simpson made it possible for people to go through the most dangerous operations without fear of pain and suffering. Some people even claim that his was one of the most significant discoveries of modern medicine. Some years later, while lecturing at the University of Edinburgh, Dr. Simpson was asked by one of his students, what do you consider to be the most valuable discovery of your lifetime? To the surprise of his students who had expected him to refer to chloroform, Dr. Simpson replied, my most valuable discovery was when I discovered myself a sinner and that Jesus Christ was my Savior. What's your most prized possession this morning? Is it Christ or is it you? I call us to look to Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. I thank you for I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're a good God. Lord, I pray that your word would hit us this morning, not in our heads, but all the way to our hearts, that we'd want to end of ourselves in the beginning of you, that we would truly seek you and be full, full in you. I pray that um, even now as we get this opportunity to remember your death and your burial and your resurrection, that, Lord, you would impress upon our hearts the fact that you're a holy God, and as a sinner, I can't stand in front of that, that you provided a way in Jesus Christ. May we cling to that, cling to your cross, and nothing else. May we look to you. May our confidence be found in this God, this God who the Scripture reveals as the one true and only living God. Thank you, thank you for Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.